Hello, beautiful people. Welcome back to the Divine Feminine Healers podcast. Um, I'm so excited to have Tiffany from Rasa Ayurveda on the podcast today. Tiffany is the founder of Vichara Yoga and Rasa Ayurveda, which is this Ayurvedic apothecary line I've been talking to all of you about that I just love all of their products. And she's also an international teacher and Ayurvedic practitioner. Thank you so much for being here today, Tiffany. Oh, thank you so much, Angelica. And thank you for all that you do also and the sharing and offering of the Vedas and Ayurveda. Thank you. I appreciate that. So something that I ask all of my guests is how do you connect or how does the divine self express herself uniquely through you? Oh, it's, it's uh, a powerful question to start right from the beginning. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I think an important place to start right from you know, the sun kalpa of why we're here, the intentionality of why it is that we're here. And, uh, and how we see life moving through us. You know, from an Ayurvedic perspective, which I find more and more integrated in my own experiential knowing of this life, that question, what arises immediately is how could we even be separate from? How could we ever move towards a fallacy of separation that we're separate from Prakriti, that we're separate from nature, that we're separate from Mama, from the divine feminine, as you gave her this word in English. But really, as we understand in Ayurveda, Prakriti is the very essentiality of every moving part of this universe, including you and I. So I think true Ayurvedic knowing, you know, and this real yama, this real coming back to a gnosis, a true understanding of Ayurveda, is when we start to realize that every particle, the trillions of processes that are going on in this system is thanks to the Great Mother. And a perfect time for us to be meeting because it's Navaratri. It's the celebration of the Divine Mother, right? Yeah. So in that way, you know, I see her expressing her herself in so many ways that I'm constantly surprised by also that are somehow configured and called Tiffany Ness. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that so much. What a, what a beautiful description of the Divine Mother. And yes, the nine day festival of the goddesses is upon us. It's such a special time. I love feeling it. Um, you know, that that shift that happens where it's just so sensitive during this time where we could really start to tap into that, um, what we want to create into this world right now and our transitioning. Yes. Um, so I, I really want to dive into Ross Ayurveda. I know you do so many other things, but I am just always so floored at Ayurvedic practitioners that can bring creations and products to life. And I have thoroughly enjoyed using your products. They've just been incredible in so many ways, which I'm sure we'll go into. But I'm so curious to hear because you have educational retreats and online courses and then the apothecary, like which one came first and how did this all come mm -hmm. to be? Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> the hip bones connected to that, right? So which one, uh, which one arose first? So years ago, Angelica, I found myself in my er very early 20s uh, guided to India and it really was a true guidance and it happened through... Um, through a, a trip to Mexico, which was through my master's, which was actually in development and international development and working especially with the land and seed saving. And what occurred uh, during that time was a lot of things directed my energetics to India, but not because I had any idea about Ayurveda or really about the depths of the Vedic tradition that I was about to become found by, if I can say it in that way, you know, that started to enter into my heart. And so in going there, the first things that touched me were yoga and meditation. And I spent a good five, six years before I returned to um, Canada, even for a visit. And, um, and it continued from there. And so really retreating and studying extensively and living and immersing and really coming to a great questioning of existence. I mean, the whole intentionality behind all of these offerings. Who are we and why are we here? I mean, that was the primary beginnings of it. So it was my own self-inquiry that brought forth then the longing to also share the little tiny bits, the limited competency that I could to anyone around me who was asking. And that's how it arose was people started asking. And one of the places that I especially found myself called towards this dharma was around the relationship between the health of this embodiment, food, and consciousness. So the yoga of also our diet and the impact of that on a global scale in holism, how we impact this earth and the great mama, and also individually how this impacts the lens and the way in which um, we come to our lives and we know who we are. 
And I thought, well, you know, I could study holistic nutrition or I could study dietics, you know, conventional dietics in a Western context, but why not Ayurveda? I was so immersed in at that time already sharing and teaching yoga meditation. And I just thought I would take, you know, at least a little bit of a deeper course and you know how it is. So I took a little bit and then a little bit more and then a little bit more. <laughs> and when I say take, actually, it's probably not the right verb to use. You know, I really was blessed by, I felt so given to. So that already started. I had already been seeing Ayurvedic doctors in India because, of course, it was part of the entirety of being touched by the Vedas. But I never thought, I never had the intention to be a healer, to have an Ayurvedic uh, clinic, to teach Ayurvedic programs, or to have an apothecary, anything like that. In fact, it all came one step at a time um, in its own divine grace. And so, yeah, the first thing was the, the studies and the love of it. And then really the blessing, which I would say there was an impactful moment when Dr. Ladd said to me in Gurukula, now you need to open a clinic. Now it's, it's time. You know, it's time to open a clinic, not just, you know, teach it in programs or in teacher trainings or see people, you know, in mild ways, but you need to have a clinic. And so about two months later, I, I came back to Canada. I opened my first space to see people. I started to have a mobile clinic also because I was teaching a lot around the world. Um, and from that place, Angelica, what happened was in Canada, we really had such a limited source of good quality Ayurvedic medicine. And I would bring things from India and from the US and from the few sources I could get in Canada. And so I started to make uh, things specifically for every single rogi, for every single patient. Wow. Started to make things for them. And then I would leave to, to teach um, elsewhere in the world for some time or however it would move and I would make them, you know, or they would ask me formulation or, you know, we would try in these ways. And that's how Rasa was born. Mm. And I said, okay, we need to have just something small, at least in Canada for my clinic specifically. <laughs> Little did I know that this wave and the blessing of Ayurveda would start to spread as, as it is. And that so many other people would want to be part of the Sangha, be part of the community and part of this movement. Mm -hmm. So that's how it's how it's moved. And it continues to grow because it is, it's the divine feminine. So she's growing and dancing and pulsing and I'm trying to keep up. <laughs> oh, that is such a beautiful story and like such a great next question after talking about the divine feminine, because you really were, you were just answering to the flow of nature. I mean, if you would have thought that, oh, here, this is going to be your life and this is the, the role that you're going to take, you would have been like, you're crazy. I, like, that's not going to happen you really have to take it step by step and surrender. And then you were really just tending to what your people needed and, and responding to your community and living into the flow and making that creation from it. That's such a beautiful expression of it. Oh, thank you. Yes, it, it feels to me, I mean, I say thank you, but it feels beautiful to me also, not to witness it and to be asked to be a part of it. I feel often in awe that this, this whole thing has asked to be and included me. Yeah. And I love that you, you know, your first taste of everything was in a retreat and that very much is a part of your offerings. I would love to hear more about your retreats. I know um, we were talking last a couple of months ago, you were on a silent retreat, which I've never been on before, but I'm so curious to hear. I can only imagine the amount of depth and inquiry and expansion that happens in those times. So if you want to speak more on that silent retreat or if there's um, other retreats that really stand out to you that you want to speak on, I'm open to hearing. Yes. Yeah, you know, that's really water for my soul also, Angelica, because I feel that the knowing, like the true knowing of Ayurveda, like what it is to be alive, really what this life is, or the true knowing of yoga, what it is to be impartial, to be unseparate, to be whole, or the true knowing of what it is to be as meditation, not to do meditation. They all come from taking times of hibernation to be in our own stillness, to be in our own quietude. It's already here. You know, an already apparency, an already isness starts to reveal itself when we can just, in simplicity, in a certain effortlessness, be with ourselves, not learn a whole host of new things, but really tap into what's already learned, what's already wisdomful. So for me, retreating uh, is so informative. It informs my soul. It's water of my soul. You know? And then, of course, there's the dynamic aspects that, you know, many times I... I I find myself also resisting, you know, that why has my life been chosen to be so dynamic somehow to really manifest in a lot of ways because I love retreating so much. And a lot of my 20s and early 30s were spent in that way, actually, mm -hmm. in, a, in a lot of retreat. And then the emergence of sharing would come from, from these kinds of retreat. 
And so I share that because I find that to be so important to also offer this gift and widen the circle of inviting others to also experience that. And, um, and so, yes, we had a silent retreat then, but we also have one coming up October 6th to 9th. And um, this one's now full. So hopefully the next retreat, we have another silent retreat that comes up over the new year. And that's something I've been doing for almost, uh, I'd say 16, 17 years now, is retreating over the new year. You know, even retreating over my own birthday, taking those silent moments. When we're present, we often think we have to make a big party of things. But actually when we're present, something happens in which the preciousness is so tasty, right? This is quiet moments, like when you get to the top of a mountain mm. or you sit beside the simplicity of a lake. So in the same way, the silent retreats I find so impactful in that way, just to be quiet for a little while. And most people say, there's no way I can be quiet for three days. How am I going to do that? But that's actually not the challenge. It's usually the challenge is more, wow, I'm seeing all of the nooks and crannies of the storehouse of suppression and repression and the areas that I've left unquestioned or that I've pushed away. And now they come to be seen. But wow, when they're seen, they also come to be not only revealed, but dissipated, reframed, changed, and also let go of. And then people walk away really feeling like they went through a major, what we could call a lakana, a major internal scraping. You know, like the greatest medicine of scraping away the amma, scraping away all the undigested stuff. Wow. So this is just a little bit. I could share so much with you about why I love sitting these and sharing them with others as well. Yeah, I, I love that that's been a part of your journey. I And that's so true. It's it's really just facing yourself because, you know, when you're in silence, you have nothing but your reflections and nothing about facing the tendencies of the mind and the emotions. I'm curious, since you do these so regularly now, and it seems like now they're this place where, well, there's all this beautiful space for these intuitive downloads to land. Do you have just a journal and you're just like writing down a lot of ideas at the time or is it more of self-healing work? Is it a combination? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Angelica. So now I don't write uh, very often in a journal, I mean, especially a discursive journal. I let the things move through and it's, it's a funny one. You know, I also love doing dark retreats. So dark retreats uh, or in the Ayurvedic tradition, um, we call it Kuti Pravashika or in the more of the yoga tradition called Kaya Kalpa. So you go into this coral of darkness. It's a powerful practice. And I hope on the land that last year I began to steward and where we have the Vichara Shala, where we have this center, um, I'm hoping we'll build a dark retreat soon as well. And in dark retreat, I have a funny story for you, which is the last dark retreat I did, which was for a week. I wrote an entire book or at least the manuscript for it. But and in dark know. retreat, you're in dark. So I used a ruler, and, you know, you're, you're writing, writing. And when I came out on Delica, I thought, okay, I captured it all. And it was all writing on top of each other. <laughs> Not a single thing was legible. Oh, my gosh. And I thought, what grace, you know? It was just the clarity of this needed to move through, to be seen. Those things need to be seen. But not necessarily yet to move into a codified, you know, uh, manifestation. And in that way, I let things be, you know, not too much... Um, movement with them until they really make themselves visible and asked for again and again and somehow i know this is a different method than others move with but no i don't conceptually write a lot of things down anymore i kind of move with as she carries you know and as she asks and i think each one of us has our own way you know we have our own dharmic flow flow and i used to journal a lot more but no it's not it's not how it how it moves now I love that because I feel like that gives such a good idea of detachment from it because, you know, we almost have this like fear response or this urgency response that comes up when we have an idea and like, I got to act on it and really put it in. And there's this level of trust in that where I trust that this is a real message that's going to come through again. And my own timing on this, there's a, there's not, I don't need to jump on this right now. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Something about that, which of course, in my book of nature, was something that had to be learned over the years because I would be more impulsive, you know, I would move with things quite quickly. Um, and so there's been more of a slowness, which I've been enjoying. And also the stabilization, you know, in the Vihara Chikitsa and the lived medicine of moving to this new property and being on the earth. Mm -hmm. Everything has slowed down and stabilized. And that's been just a medicine in and of itself to watch the seasons, mm -hmm. you know, to watch the natural revealing of things, to watch how things need to take their time for fruition, right? So... 
oh, hmm. I love that so much. I hope you can come here sometime. Angelica. I, You're so welcome. I, I honestly just heard about dark retreats and um, it really interested me. I it like sparked something in me like, whoa, I couldn't imagine doing that. Yeah. Whenever I have that feeling, I know it's something that I have to do. So yeah. I, I love that you are um, going to be offering that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I hope so. Yeah, so you you embody Dharma and just naturally what you do, it, it, it's expressed in everything that you do. But I'm so curious how this uniquely is expressed through your apothecary. Yes, I think in the apothecary, and I love your questions, Angelica, if we were to say how Dharma is that, you know, I might get some flack sometimes from really traditional um, Ayurvedic doctors that say these aren't the traditional formulas, for example. But, you know, from the beginning with what we were offering, I could only move from what was of the deepest integrity in my own being and heart and soul, which was that I wanted the Ayurvedic principles, which, as you know, the principles of being as closest to nature and by being closest to nature and then as unadulterized. So whether it's the herbs or the oils, etc., unadulterated, also that they be local. So we often think of Ayurveda as Indian. Somehow it's become synonymous, in fact. But yes, it's emerged from the Indus Valley. But to make it truly applicable to embodiments here and now, we also have to be inclusive of Ayurvedic principles in the here and now. So Western herbs included. Of course, we are always considering the rasa, the pitaka, the, vir the virya. We're considering the entirety of the dravya guna. We're considering always the substance and, and how it's affecting a specific constitution, etc. So we know all of these things. But I knew for me, it needed to be organic. So things needed to be organic. And that's why Rasa is entirely organic. Even though not everything is certified organic, we're still, we stay in that commitment. So it's not any kind of greenwashing. Yeah. We can just say, you know, we're organic. You can trust us or not, but it's not so that, you know, we can be on every organic shelf. It's, it's out of integrity, again, and out of this Dharma commitment. Also, we have some things that are wild crafted. So if we are going to use any herbs, like herbs, for example, like Chakamamsi, spike nard, which more and more needs to be cared for in the Nepali Himalayas, for example, we make sure that it comes from beings who wild craft that herb in the sustainable ways in which it's allocated, in which it's allowed, for example. Right? So being very clear about all of these principles were so, so important for me. And also an interesting one is that Rasta, as uh, has also been my own pathway in this life, is vegan. So whether we use the label of vegan or plant-based, but really the minimizing of harm has been such an important pillar in my own life since I was a child. Honestly, you know, my mom said this to me recently. She said, no, no, you were born vegan. We just didn't know. We just didn't know what to do about it. You know, we didn't know what to do. So we said, eat your meat anyways. Like, I don't know what to do. So, so right, they were trying their hardest. And so with that also, again, Ayurveda, as you know, doesn't say anywhere in the text that we have to avoid uh, the use of any drug, yeah, any substance inclusive of animals. So of course, as inclusive of metals, inclusive of gemstones, there's so many, everything in Prakriti, everything in nature can be used at the right time in the right place. That's Charaka offers, right? So in that way, animals are included, yeah. but there's always the principle in the way in which they're used, of course. But nevertheless, again, dharmically, I felt it's so important to keep Rasa vegan. Mm -hmm. And so we adhere to that. You know, everything that we offer also minimizes and has ahimsa first, it's nonviolence first. And it's not that I don't support, and also if people are looking for um, some of the traditional formulas that involve, for example, bone or traditional formulas that might involve uh, milk or ghee, et cetera, then we also have availability to suggest or to point people in the right way. But we have our own niche and that's our niche, you know, that really aligns to that. Yeah, I love that in so many ways. It's so fun to connect with Ayurvedic brands because there's a level of intentionality in products that make it just completely out of this world to me to even comprehend on that level because truly every detail that goes into it, there's an intention, there's a reason behind it. And it, it's an embodiment of how you're expressing your divine feminine. And I also love that you started with within this modern context, because I truly believe that's how the Vedas were meant to be um, processed and, and used, is that it's mm -hmm. dynamic by nature. When we apply these Ayurvedic principles 
you know, they're not meant to be just relevant to those times, as you mentioned, they're meant to be relevant to no matter what time we're in. But if we are closed off to just this more dogmatic perspective on how they were taught in the past, and we're not seeing how it wants to be expressed fully, then we're kind of missing the whole point there. So I love that you are on top of that and doing that in your in your public area. Oh, and I love how you expressed it now as well, Angelica, absolutely, because this is what will allow also the depth and the wisdom and the breadth of Ayurveda to be sustained and for it not to be superficialized. You know, we already see this dilution and superficiality that's occurring in many of the Vedic actually sciences, I could say, right? So this has happened in yoga and, and it's starting to happen also in Ayurveda where we relegate Ayurveda to being, I don't know, Indian dietics or only, you know, spa treatments or, uh, or maybe beauty products, right? Things like that. And we've lost the depth of it, I think, by really staying attuned to what is the modern context and what is it that we're needing? How, how much of a necessity is it that we really know ourselves and know what it is to be alive? How much of a necessity is it that this wisdom is made available to us now in the context now where, you know, I sit here with Bluetooth headphones and we're able to <laughs> have contact in this way, right? How can we apply it now? And then the things that might have been antiquated or seen antiquated when we read the text, you know, they can be fully, fully applied and even more necessary. I mean, at what time besides now is it ever more necessary that we align our diets and our lifestyles and our daily routine? I mean, these wisdoms now more than ever are so, so needed. Yeah, I, I love all of that so much. It's so important. And I, I agree, like when I first started, I started doing Ayurveda consultations and it just seemed like everyone was coming to me for diet because it seemed like, oh, Ayurveda is, that's the diet version of, of yoga, of what you should eat, you know? And, and, and that is so true. Like I never actually thought it within the parameters of yoga because yoga in the West is asana. It's just the postures. And as we know, it was, it's mantras, it's kundalini, it's breath work, it's meditation, it's the actual practice of yoga and your relationships. It's, it's all of that in one. And that segmentation um, doesn't make sense anymore. It's really just to pull back in, in the principles. And I love that you're apothecary. Like you can feel it when you're using your products. Like you can feel that level of intentionality. And I actually love your herbal formulas. I've been using your Pitta facial oil and toner and I tend to have more oily skin and it's been like a glow. I, I just am so beyond like I, it's been so nutrients to my skin, honestly, more than anything I've really used before. So I'm curious how you are formulating these herbs and how you come up with them. Oh, I'm so, uh, firstly, I just, I'm always overjoyed when I hear that it's a gift to someone's life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these came, Angelica, in a way that all I can say is, you know, we use this word in English, like a download. Like I have no, you know, of course, I was so informed by all of the great ideas, all of the great teachers and doctors and offering of the lineage, absolutely. But I was really surprised. It was a one-year span in which from the moment that Rasa came really as one of those whisperings that then became a screaming of the soul that this needed to be born, that they started to come, just come and come and come. And of course, there was tons of research that was put into it as well. But as the things started to come, then I would sit with each herb that was being inspired or, you know, the ways in which things were being inspired. And then, of course, the principles also of combination of some, you know, uh, of how we combine things, of how things fit together. All of those were a background of, uh, um, of information that was there. But again and again, it was just such an inspiring process for the formulations to come through. They wanted to be, you know, there was this wanting to be born. And even now there's so many other things that want to be born, but we have such a huge product line. And I, I don't really like calling it a product line, but we have a huge apothecary line, right? So we have, I think over a hundred products. Wow. And, um, and that seems like more than enough right now <laughs> before, we birth, <laughs> before birthing happens. So again, that patience is there before some other things uh, arise. Mm, wow. Just another level, but, but just to really sit with the herbs and to come up with these herbal formulas, it makes so much sense that that's the way that it's being translated in your products. And I love that you also have this attention to be eco-conscious and you kind of mentioned how like Chattamanzi is being um, overhauled and how you can actually work with the land more so that you're not overusing certain herbs. Um, for example, I'm curious what you're seeing because I imagine it is so difficult bringing sustainability 
especially when no other product lines are really doing this. Um, I do have like other ones, like, I don't know if you've heard of Living Libations. I, I love them. Yes. Yeah. And what they're doing. And um, that's great. But there's just like so far few in between. So I'm curious yes. what you're kind of seeing in the eco-friendly realm and how you're uh, wanting to bring this into your products. No, I love it. I love also that, you know, living libations. I have like direct uh, connection actually with with them. And I think they've bought some of our products. And also, I have dear friends who have worked uh, for them and with them. And yeah, so, uh, and mutual friends. So it's beautiful to hear that, that you know yes. of them because they're a beautiful Canadian company. Just amazing and amazing being also. Yeah. We had and Nadine also Nadine. conscientious. So conscientious, conscientious. And I, I read Nadine's books and she's so great. And uh, her boutique, they have one in Venice. Um, which is where I live. It's like a block away. So it's, it's so great. Oh, amazing. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So from the beginning, this was also now what? Now, how do we bring all of this to the world in a way that again, stays in alignment with the deepest integrity to also the Ayurvedic understanding that this is for the whole, you know, that we are really systemically also contributing to healthfulness, to swasta. Because then what's the point? This becomes a selfish science. And then we're totally not aligned to Ayurveda. So I really needed to consider what will our packaging look like? How will we put... So for example, everything is in uh, amber and recyclable glass, right? So we use this glass where everything is also in craft paper uh, bags or also our boxing even is in recycled boxes. Could it look actually for the quality of the product? Let me say it in this way. Could it look more chic? Could we have used other things? Absolutely. Was that also pitched to us? Absolutely. Could we have used frosted things? And could we have also used, you know, labels that had more of a sheen and a gloss and a various things to them? Could we have had bags that had plastics in them also so that it would hold the paper differently and it would hold the labels differently? Absolutely. Angela, all of that, we went through it. And I just said, no, I'm unwilling to compromise. Because at the end of the day, once you open that bag of tea or you open the potion, which is in, again, the amber glass bottle, and you receive it from that rather than from a, a conventional kind of plastic bottle, which, of course, our shipping is more expensive. And if things break that are uh, glass and shipping, we don't have insurance for that because they're glass. So we take all of that, you know, into our responsibility of this. But we know that as soon as it's opened and it's experienced in that way, that, that this makes the difference, you know, and it makes the difference every day for everyone who's part of the Rasa family, working in the apothecary, contributing, you know, sharing, everyone feels right about what it is that they're doing, how they're doing it, the way in which we're living. And write down yes to the oils and the herbs, making sure and continuously making sure where we're sourcing from. Mm. You know, one of the major concerns I get with Ayurvedic herbs, traditional herbs, we could say more from India, is some of the research on heavy metals and the herbs. So making sure that we are getting organic herbs that have been third-party tested. This is really rare because a lot of these traditional herbs, so we're talking about things like manjista or brahmi, for example, right? Some of these herbs we've heard of, amalaki, I'm using more conventional, or let's say more well-known herbs in the West, trifala, whatever it might be. A lot of them have contained heavy metals when they've made their way towards North America and when they've been tested by the FDA. So we're making sure that you know, we're sourcing really organic ones that have been third-party tested and we know, we know the quality of that. So you know, in all of these ways, as much as we can, making sure that our sourcing also is so Ayurvedically aligned to love and to grace and to consideration of the land and its peoples. Mm. It's such a true testament to Dharma. And I, like I said, when I had other Ayurvedic brands on there, I don't know if you've heard of Farm Chuki. I've had them on. Um, no. oh, they, they create such wonderful small batched ghee and the way that they do it. And it's just a premier level of ghee that, they're, that they create. And there's so many times like Whole Foods and these big companies reach out to them, like we want to expand it, but then that would lose the integrity of it. And like you, you've been asked in question, it's like, oh, this would profit, you know, this would help it grow in a certain way. But it would go against really what my dharma is saying and go against that. And I, that's just so respectable and honorable to see that you're making that sacrifice for the greater part of the earth when you look around you and not everyone is, is making those decisions. I can only imagine the difficulty, but you truly are pioneering in that way and such an inspiration for, for our community. So thank you so much for doing that. I love, I, I find it so aesthetically pleasing. Still, I love all the products. I think they're so beautiful and you do it in your own way. And I'm curious, 
I don't know if there's certain products that you're like bubbling up to the surface. I know you're feeling hands full with a hundred, but any uh, directions that you see the apothecary line going in in the future? You know, there's always the hope that also will include the little beings. And also, I always want some other things for, for the little ones in our lives. So, you know, things for mamas and things for babies. And, you know, that's been there for quite some time. And having also kits and offerings that, um, that will be uh, for pre and postnatal periods. You know, I really feel that, especially that time, the fifth uh, mester, uh, you know, that time of staying home, the postpartum period, I feel having more nourishing um, offerings also for that. So there's a lot of things, including just even some other, you know, there are many ideas that come from our, our client base and our customers. And I'm constantly in awe, you know, I could use this or we could use this. I think, okay, wonderful. That would, and recently someone was asking about Ayurveda for pets, you know, and it's not a thing that we do or that I do, but you know, you never know. Maybe someone could come in to inform and, and to bring the inspiration around that. Again, inclusive of all the beings. Wow. So those are some things that are bubbling up. We'll see how things move. The postpartum sounds so incredible. I think that so many women are awakening to how important that transition is and how we kind of overlook it and don't really take that moment of pause. And those products would be so nurturing to them and really help them to come back to those Ayurvedic rituals that they can do to, to heal as they move into that whole new identity. It's such a huge identity mm -hmm. and a shift. Like it needs to have its own um, visibility like really yes. understanding and taking the time to treat this as a different stage of my life. Yes. 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 And imagine if, you know, we had kids also that mama or grandma could buy so that they really have an at home support for the new mother and baby, you know, like really, okay, we're going into 40 days. Here we are, <laughs> you know, we've got everything for it. Yes. So I often have the vision for something like that. Oh, I love it so much. Um, I know you have, again, like, not just the apothecary line and i know we won't have time to talk about all the other hands or pots your hands are in but if you it could just start by telling our community a little bit more about outside of rasa ayurveda apothecary all your other offerings yes i don't really know how this embodiment uh, goes throughout its days with all the things that uh, that are required <laughs> So there is the apothecary and, of course, the vision and everything that moves um, there and the education. And then also clinically, I see individuals both online and also in person. And then there's an educational component. So either seeing people in consultation, but also the educational component is especially I offer uh, teacher training, sometimes in yoga and Ayurveda. But I also offer my kind of flagship program is this 50 hour Ayurveda immersion, which is a 16 week class and it's online. We started it two weeks ago. So every week we have three hours together. And I just love this. We have you know, hundreds of people coming from different places around the world and, um, and sharing really from you know, the 101, but really the depth and the juice and the intentionality of Ayurveda and the already isness, like I began with, with you, reminding people that this isn't some concept and map from somewhere else, that now they have to ingest and figure out and learn, but rather revealing our already knowing of what it is to exist and live and really live in our alignment. So giving them this experiential time, uh, it, it spans over about three and a half, four months, and, and that's another thing that I do. And then I also share uh, meditation and yoga, both through our little shala. So we have a little uh, yoga studio here on site mm -hmm. and the retreats as well. So offering them that way um, in various forms, some are classes, some are you know, ongoing series, and some are also private. So I work with a lot of people privately as well in yoga meditation who are looking to deepen in classical practices, um, which is one of my first, my first loves as well. So that's what the day looks like, um, as well as all my other joyful, you know, loves for life. I'm an active person, so I love, you know, so many things, every way in which I can also move the body, my own sadhana, but I also love, you know, it's beautiful here, as I was sharing with you in, in Quebec, where I live now. And so I'm out on the trails, whether it's hiking or cross-country skiing or, you know, occasionally getting out on a bike or on the water paddling. Also, there's a lot of offerings to just be with Prakriti here as well. So that's, that's a little, you know, offering of what, what it is that, uh, that my days more or less look like. So beautiful. I'm going to have all of that linked in the show notes so our community can get to know you and work with your beautiful offerings. They're so magnetic. And I think this is also 
really inspiring. I, I call all of us soulpreneurs. Um, I have a lot of uh, new members who are starting to build their spiritual business. So this is so inspiring to them to see what can be really possible. Um, and this beautiful world that they can create for themselves is so beautifully as you've created. And I'm so looking forward to hearing more about your retreats and, and possibly joining. That would just be such a gift. And I'm really honored for your time today and your wisdom. You're a true embodiment of, of the Vedas oh. and, and Ayurveda and yoga. And it really was a gift to have you on today. I'm, I'm so grateful. And I'm so grateful for finding an Ayurvedic apothecary line, which is so it, that just really gets the body and also has this femininity to it and i feel honors the the lineage but also like you said it expresses itself uniquely through you so uh there's so much goodness there i'm just so grateful for it all oh i'm really touched angelic i'm also touched just for the contact with you also you know it feels like when we find sangha sisters ones who also have the vibrancy and the radiance to be in the offering and the dharma of sharing so thank you also for all the work you're doing to share inclusive of this moment right now, which is through these podcasts. I mean, so juicy and wonderful. So thank you for that as well, for all that you do. Oh, I appreciate that. So felt. All right, everyone. I'll have all that linked in the show notes so you can find it. And we'll see you next time on the Divine Feminine Healers podcast.